The government has now decided that a large task force will sail as soon as all preparations are complete. In April 1982, Britain sent nearly 30,000 young soldiers, sailors and air crew 8,000 miles to the South Atlantic to reclaim the Falkland Islands after they were invaded by Argentina. won victory would transform the nation. I think the Falklands War was an extraordinary military achievement. We came back after that war to a different sort of Britain. But success wasn't guaranteed. Speaking publicly for the first time, the then commanding officer of the SAS reveals how close the task force came to defeat. They say it was down to 10 minutes that we might well have lost the war. Commanders and ground troops talk candidly, shedding new light on flaws in the operation. The whole command chain was utterly dysfunctional. Some claim that Goose Green, the most famous battle in the war, need never have been fought, and was a waste of lives and resources. The orders to attack and capture Goose Green. I mean, I thought it was a stupid thing to do. Lieutenant Colonel Jones, Captain Jones. How a sudden change in the plan for the land campaign nearly lost Britain the war. They were sitting ducks. It was completely unnecessary and sadly cost 200 casualties. The truth certainly needs to be told about some of the things that went wrong. I mean, how did it happen? With recordings of the negotiations to end the conflict uncovered for the first time. He is prepared to consider surrender and secret satellite communications from a British undercover mission in Chile. Without this information, we would have lost the war. 40 years on, the Falklands War is still giving up its secrets. Everyone happy? OK, good. Jan Christopher Coops is my name, and I was the second in command of the Prince of Wales's company, the 1st Battalion of the Welsh Guards. I was the captain of the rugby team. We had an outstanding team. The one or two really standout players was a chap called Di Graham. Alongside him, Clifford Ellie and Andy Walker. I mean, I could probably name you the whole squad as we're sitting here now. And we had just won the Army Cup. It was the pinnacle of my, of my youthful life. Shortly after that sweet moment of success, we heard the news that the Argentinians had invaded the Falklands. It would appear the sun has set on yet another corner of the British Empire. This one far down in the South Atlantic. Argentina today invaded and seized the Falkland Islands, which have been under British rule for nearly 150 years. At 2 o'clock in the morning, I was telephoned by Jeremy Moore, my boss, and he just said, bring your brigade to short notice and sail on Tuesday. This was Friday morning. I was at home, and the duty driver knocked at the door, and he says, you've got to get back into camp. I says, why? He says, the Argentinians have invaded the Falklands. And I'm thinking, Falklands, that's got to be a Scotland. Why would they attack Scotland? In 1982, Britain was unprepared to launch a military campaign to reclaim islands 8,000 miles away that few could find on a map. The previous year, we'd just really been hit by the not defence review. It was going to take away our carriers, our amphibious ships, possibly even the Royal Marines. And the discussion went along the lines of we really need a war against somebody, <laughs> just to show the country and the politicians how good we are. If the frantic diplomacy failed, thousands of British troops would need to launch a land campaign on the Falkland Islands to retake them. The task was given to three commando brigade, 3,000 Royal Marines backed up by two battalions of paratroopers. But first, the Navy had to transport them to the South Atlantic and land them on the islands. 
it was the biggest amphibious uh, logistical challenge since D-Day. It was scary. And time was short. It would take at least seven weeks to get a naval task force to the remote islands. And the South Atlantic winter was less than 75 days away. We knew that this was all going to happen 8,000 miles from home, which is an awful long way. We knew that the weather was liable to be dreadful. In wars, things have a ghastly habit of going horribly wrong. In 1982, Michael Rose commanded Britain's elite Special Forces Regiment 22 SAS. He's speaking publicly for the first time about the Falklands War. After 40 years, it's time a full story was told. In 1980, just two years earlier, the SAS had become national heroes when they ended the Iranian embassy siege but some at the top seemed reluctant to use them in the new crisis. After a couple of days of not hearing from anyone, it became apparent that the Royal Navy had never heard of the Special Air Service and that we were not on the order of battle. We, we had to do what we normally do, is, is make our own way. I telephoned Julian Thompson. Mike Rose, who I knew from Northern Ireland days, uh, rang me up and said, do you want us? I said, right, well, come on, join the party. 100 SAS would now join the task force on the journey south. With their naval counterparts in the special boat service, they would be inserted behind enemy lines to prepare for the main landings. It wouldn't all be plain sailing. We were badly equipped. We hadn't got enough of many things that we could expect to have going to war. And it was all, what's the expression? A lash up. That's a naval expression. A very British lash up was about to be complicated further. Overall command of the task force was assigned to the Royal Navy, working from its headquarters in a bunker deep under Northwood in Middlesex. Now, the trouble with Northwood was that they were accustomed to harassing Russian submarines. Now, you can do that very happily by radio, sitting in a bunker in Middlesex. But trying to run an amphibious operation 8,000 miles away is a totally different ball game. It was a good decision that the Royal Navy should be in the lead. But what Northwood didn't do uh, was turn itself into an integrated joint headquarters. So they had no military or air force input it was inevitable that it was going to be a command and control muddle from the start. Admiral John Fieldhouse would oversee operations from the Middlesex bunker. But instead of appointing a single commander in the field, the Navy appointed three. Royal Marine Brigadier Julian Thompson was in charge of the land force comprising three commando brigade. Admiral Sandy Woodward commanded the Naval Task Force and Commodore Michael Clapp directed the amphibious landings. The whole command chain was utterly dysfunctional. Throughout, there was this feeling of who's in charge of this bit? You were never sure at any one point who was driving bits of the campaign. We very nearly lost the war because of some extraordinarily bad decisions that were taken by Northwood with regards to the land battle. There was one other choice that would have a profound effect on the campaign. In three commando brigades wake would come a second force, five infantry brigade, to provide reinforcements after the landings. It was made up of a battalion each from the Welsh and Scots guards and the Gurkhas. In April, it was put through its paces by its commander, Brigadier Tony Wilson, on a training exercise in Wales. So I thought I'd better go and have a look at this lot. And my first impression was, God, what a bloody shambles this lot is. Surely they're not thinking of sending them abroad to fight a real war. We were sitting in Brecon Beacons, and the brigade commander appeared and said, we're going to do a brigade attack tonight, and I want you to make the plan. And we thought, hang on, 
he should be giving us the plan. Brigadier Tony Wilson had come out as so indecisive and so incompetent in Wales that they decided that he should be removed from his command. General Bramall, who was the Chief of Defence, overruled that decision because he thought it would be bad for the morale of the brigade to have its brigadier removed. Bramall told me that it was the worst decision he'd taken in 45 years of soldiery, and it was. I would have sacked um, brigade commander then and there, just on the evidence I saw on this test exercise, let alone what he got up to when he got to the Falklands. When we sailed from Southampton, suddenly everybody's waving the Union Jack again, and suddenly all the jingoism, it's all back. It's back to Kipling and standing there on the quayside waving the flags um, to go off and, and fight Johnny Foreigner somewhere on the other side of the world. On board were the men who would launch the initial landing, the Marines and paratroopers of 3 Commando Brigade. My name's Sulia Laji. During the Falklands War, I was a private soldier in three para. I thought, when they hear that we're gonna come, they're just gonna say, let's go home. But when this ship blew its horn and we started to sail, I thought, hang on, I'm probably not gonna come back. In fact, I was convinced I was gonna die. For years, the army had been mired in the Northern Ireland Troubles. The crisis gave them a chance to fight a more conventional war against an enemy in uniform. All the way down, we kept getting little news snippets of what the politicians were trying to do and head off this, this, this war. We were hoping the politicians weren't successful. We were all sort of anxious to, come on, let's get down there and get on with it. You know, when I look back now, I think it was great, you know. Oh, Britannia, Britannia, oh, oh. As the task force headed south, the SAS made a secret deal with US Special Forces friends to ensure they were equipped with the latest high-tech kit. Before leaving England, um, I got a call from uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Burroughs, known to everybody as Bucky Burroughs, uh, who was the chief executive officer of Delta Force. He said, but, uh, Michael, you're going to need some things I've got here. I said, what are those, Bucky? He said, you're going to need portable tactical satellites. I said, yeah, I've seen you demonstrate. They would be incredibly useful for us. He said, I'm going to send you eight or nine of those. The new satellite phones allowed Michael Rose to talk to his commanders in the field and the headquarters in Northwood back in the UK using an American satellite channel. What the Americans did was allow us to use that segment of the satellite. The day the war ended, the satellite was switched off. With the British Army still tapping out some of their battlefield communications in Morse code, portable satellite telephones gave the SAS an invaluable advantage. Tactical satellites we had been lent by Bucky Barrett was a personal loan to me. It was a great pressure for me to hand two of them over to the MOD, and I absolutely refused to allow that. They had their naval communications, and I was not going to let them interrupt my own communications. The British were already facing an enormous challenge. The Argentinians had complete control of the islands. When we arrived on the island, I felt very emotional and blessed to be able to defend my country. Toda la población argentina eh, apoyó la recuperación. Es un sentimiento muy fuerte de soberanía y, y las islas son parte de nuestras casas. Sentir un lugar familiar, un lugar al que, al que quiero y un lugar donde estuve dispuesto a dejar mi vida. Y lo volvería a hacer. For Argentina, the war was a diversion from a vicious internal conflict. John Shakespeare, my name. I was at the British Embassy in Buenos Aires. My name's Nicholas Shakespeare. I was in Argentina as an adolescent. The Argentine military dictatorship were getting more and more brutal. The military 
persecution of the young and of anybody left wing was going on. I mean, we now know that 30,000 people up, upwards were killed. I think the armed forces felt very contaminated by what they had done to their population. And I think they sought an external adventure that would kind of purify them. Britain was also shaken by its own upheavals. It's very hard to recapture the sense of failure that hung over Britain in the late 70s and early 1980s. We couldn't make cars that anybody wanted to buy. Um, we couldn't make a washing machine that was likely to work to the end of its guarantee. It was politically a very divided time. There were riots in many British cities in the summer of 1981. Polls showed that Margaret Thatcher was the least popular prime minister since 1945. Going to war was a high-risk gamble for Mrs. Thatcher. So an early success was essential. The first objective was the recapture of South Georgia, 800 miles east of the Falklands and part of its territory. South Georgia was absolutely vital to be taken quickly because it signaled that we meant business. A force including 150 Marines and 70 SAS troops who had joined the task force on the way down was assigned to retake South Georgia. The SAS seized the initiative by planning a recce behind enemy lines. They wanted to land on a glacier which was called uh, Fortuna. Um, it's about 4,200 feet up and it was a fairly hostile environment. It took three attempts by three Wessex helicopters to get the SAS troopers onto the glacier. The weather was really quite atrocious, very high winds up to 80 knots, and there was driving snow and rain. We put the um, troops on the ground, went back to the ship and thought, thank God for that, we're not gonna have to do that again. That night, um, we had a hurricane come through. It was a disaster uh, within 24 hours, the 16 men had to be evacuated in appalling weather. It's really like flying down the streets of Manhattan in thick fog, with mountains either side of you. Of the three helicopters that took off on the rescue mission, two crashed, fully laden with SAS. All survived. After Chris and his crew in the remaining chopper dropped off their load of SAS survivors, they had to return to pick up the rest. We put the survivors, all 12 of them, uh, in the back. The aircraft only takes four people. And we were a ton overweight, and we had to wait for an 80-knot wind to take off to give us a lift. And I have to say, a little bit of me was saying, I wonder how they're going to explain this. <laughs> we just lost two aircraft and our first sort of attempt to get on the island has gone badly. When a dear old SAS screwed up on, on Fortuna Glacier, uh, had they lost a lot of people, which they nearly did, I believe it might have propelled the government into giving up. Then luck and quick thinking intervened. And we then picked up a high-powered um, transmission uh, from something. Now, there aren't many ships in the South Atlantic, especially not that far south. So we started thinking, uh, who is operating this type of transmission? We went to have a look at it. Ian, my first pilot, said, it's a submarine. He was just breaking the surface with his fin. We ran in. We dropped the depth charges, and the whole back end of the submarine blew out the water. It totally transformed the situation uh, at South Georgia, because with the submarine out of the way, it meant that we could go ahead and do almost what we wanted to. Royal Marines and the SAS went ashore. But before they could engage the enemy, HMS Antrim shelled Argentine positions. And they surrendered without a fight. 
Margaret Thatcher must have been tremendously relieved. It must have been the first moment when she really felt her judgment vindicated. The white ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. What happens next? What's Thank, you. Thank you very much. Just What's your rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Rejoice. As Mrs. Thatcher celebrated, the SAS were planning to insert patrols onto the islands by helicopter to prepare for the main landings. But official reluctance to help meant they had to use their own initiative. Admiral Woodward, the planning conference, asked me who I was and what my contribution could be, which I told him. And he then said to me, well, Michael, that sounds absolutely wonderful. Please do the best you can which in fact were the only orders I got through the rest of the war. Unfortunately, his staff didn't pick up on that and give me the logistic support I needed. So I had to sort of wing it using old contacts and common sense. To get behind enemy lines, the SAS needed the helicopters of 846 Squadron. The squadron commander, I by chance had been at the same school with him, so we had certain things in common and uh, we found it very easy to talk to each other. Well, there was a daily tasking conference uh, I tended to take the brief and then go and talk to Mike and he would tell me what he actually needed. Throw the rule book to the wind, get on with what you know is best, work together and let's win this war. And that's exactly what we did. Three weeks before the invasion, 846 Squadron inserted special forces using a new generation of night vision goggles. SAS patrols were flown onto West Falkland. Others were landed at strategic spots on East Falkland, overlooking Port Stanley, at Darwin Goose Green to monitor the Argentine garrison there, at Bluff Cove, seen as a potential landing zone, and Mount Kent, 10 miles from the capital. Ship right ahead on that bearing. Ask sonar to identify each target if we can. One month after the crisis erupted, the conflict escalated dramatically. The British submarine Conqueror sank the battle cruiser Belgrano. 323 Argentine sailors were killed. Retaliation was inevitable. It's the right hand ship. The right hand ship is Sheffield. 20 British sailors died after HMS Sheffield was hit by an Exocet missile. It was a sobering moment of, this is it, you know, it started. The loss of the Sheffield highlighted the vulnerability of the task force as it closed in on the islands. The manuals say that you should not have an amphibious landing unless you've got air superiority, and here we are without air superiority. To help protect the fleet, a secret weapon was needed. It came in the form of a wing commander from the sales department of the Ministry of Defense, now speaking for the first time about his exploits. My job was to be totally covert. Without this information, we would have lost the war. By sinking the Sheffield, the Argentinian Air Force had proved it could stop the task force in its tracks. Something had to be done. My name is Sid Edwards. I was a wing commander at the time of the Falklands War. I was mowing the lawn in my little house in the Thames Valley when my wife threw the kitchen window open and said, darling, there's an air marshal wants to talk to you from London. I answered the phone and he said, how long will it take you to get to Northwood? And I said, about an hour, sir. And he said, well, make it 45 minutes. I'll be there at the main gate. When Sidney Edwards met his boss, Ken Hare, at Northwood, he was offered an unusual mission. There were more senior officers than I've ever seen in my life. And then Ken Hare had said, Wing Commander Sid Edwards is going to be going out to Chile. That was the first time I'd heard that I was going to Chile. 
And so I was a bit surprised, to say the least. <laughs> For the first time, Sid Edwards talks about his cloak and dagger mission to help protect the task force from Argentinian bombers. The cooperation I got in Chile was absolutely first class. I was dealing with the commander in chief of the Chilean Air Force, working directly with President Pinochet. Britain, now in bed with a dictatorship almost as brutal as the Argentine junta, negotiated access to vital radar warnings of impending Argentine air attacks. I discovered that the radar cover from Punta Arenas, which is in the south of Chile, gave very good cover of the Argentinian airfields in the south of their country. And I thought that would be very good if we could uh, get that information as, as live as we could directly to the fleet. To pass this intelligence on in time, an SAS team armed with one of Bucky Burris's new portable satellite telephones slipped into Chile. Our soldiers, using their satellites, were able to give a warning of Argentine aircraft heading for the Falkland Islands to hit the fleet. And that allowed the Harrier to be in position when the Argentine Air Force arrived. So in a way, it was a war-winning capability that Bucky actually lent us. Chile's secret contribution didn't stop there. Well, I was asked if we could base a Nimrod intelligence gathering aircraft in, in Chile. I passed this request on to the Chilean Air Force, and they said, yes, you, you may, but you can't put it on mainland uh, Chile. So Sid helped put the RAF spy plane onto a Chilean island in the Pacific to eavesdrop on Argentine air movements. Many of the skilled Argentine pilots still got through, but at least now, there were warnings of some of the raids. I personally believe, and it's been confirmed by people with much more knowledge than me, that without this information, we would have lost the war. Argentine aircraft already on the Falklands also threatened the task force. With invasion looming, the SAS and 846 squadron improvised a daring raid to take out a force of Pucara aircraft. How the raid actually came about is revealed for the first time. The Argentine Pucara is an extremely capable ground attack aircraft and could do a lot of damage to Julian Thompson's troops moving in very open terrain. So it was essential that we uh, diminished the uh, numbers of Pucara. There still remain eight of them in Pebble Island. And so Julian asked me if we could destroy those. The raid on the airfield on Pebble Island was initially vetoed by Admiral Sandy Woodward. To launch the Special Forces helicopters, Vulnerable warships would have to come within reach of the Argentinian Super Etondard aircraft. We persuaded Admiral Woodward by talking about a radar which we suspected was on um, um, Pebble Island. And so he became obsessed with this uh, radar and said, how can we destroy it? An SAS raiding party was inserted near the Argentine base. In a surprise attack, with the support of naval gunfire, 11 aircraft were destroyed. Afterwards, Admiral Woodward had a burning question. So when Admiral Woodward said, and what about the radar? What radar, said the squadron commander? No, there was never a radar there. We made it up. I don't think he quite trusted us after that. After considering several plans, task force commanders decided on a landing in San Carlos water. From there, they would attack the capital Port Stanley, 50 miles away. Speed was essential. The South Atlantic winter was looming. Back in the UK, the Welsh and Scots Guards and Gurkhas who made up five brigade were ready to sail, a month after the first flotilla. I think most people were surprised at the two battalions that were sent uh, because both Guards battalions had not really had an opportunity to deal with the survival conditions you know, they were going to face in, uh, in the Falklands. The Guards tell a different story. We were fit, we were trained psychologically, 
we were prepared for it. Uh, the, the, the battalion was in good shape. Sailing with Fire Brigade and its boss, Tony Wilson, was Royal Marine General Jeremy Moore. On his arrival in the Falklands, Moore would assume overall command of the land forces, allowing Julian Thompson to focus on the battles to come. Before departing England, Moore was questioned about his strategy. Very senior British Army general said to him, so what are the plans for after the landings have taken place? Jeremy Moore said to him, there are no plans. He said, well, there have to be some plans. He said, now I shall decide what the plan for onward movement from St. Connors Water will be after I've got to the Fulton Islands. But he didn't get to the Fulton Islands till the 30th of May when it was almost, the war was almost over. In the meantime, Julian Thompson and his men pressed on with their own strategy for winning the war. Fifty days after Argentina invaded the Falklands, British forces were finally poised to attempt the island's recapture. $64,000 question is day or night. We decided we'd do a night landing, because landing at night meant we'd be pretty well free of the Argentine Air Force. With the QE2 still steaming to the South Atlantic, the Royal Navy began landing three commando brigade at San Carlos overnight. But as dawn broke, men and supplies were still going ashore, and the cruise liner Canberra lay exposed in San Carlos water. It was the most beautifully blue, clear day you've seen. It was absolutely the worst type of weather for being attacked by jet aircraft. Suddenly, enemy air attacks came in from all directions. And I personally was really frightened because Canberra was stuffed with ammunition and fuel. And if we'd actually been hit, it probably would have been a serious disaster. There's no laughing or joking now. The noise was deafening, explosions. It was terrifying. I, I can just remember gritting my teeth. Every muscle in my body was locked tight. The gun crews, mostly 17 years old, soon had more battle experience than anyone else in the Navy. They start shouting up on the radio, two hostile aircraft, 50 miles, five minutes, heart rate's getting faster, mouth's getting drier, the adrenaline's picking up now, and these two mirages come screaming through the sound. They're literally at our eye level. I'm just trying to put a wall of lead down ahead of the mirage at the right elevation so it flies through it. So I'm chugging away. And I can hear behind me this size and he's jumping up and down like, the, you know, his team's won the, won the cup. And I'm going, yeah, brilliant, you, you hit it, you hit it. I'm only 17 and here I am on the bridge of the camera shooting at um, fighter jets. <laughs> In four days, the Argentine Air Force sank three British vessels and damaged six others. There was definitely a um, psychological wobble. I think people were beginning to worry about how long the Navy could sustain losing ships in the way they did. The British ships suffered heavy losses the ground troops landed unopposed. It took six weeks to sail down there, and every day, twice a day, I'd wax my German paratrooper boots, and I'd wrapped um, tape around the top so the water wouldn't get in from the top. And then I ended up in the water. As I was walking, I thought, the boots are good, the boots are good. No, they're not, the water started coming in, so I had wet feet from day one, and I was not a happy soldier. British troops were now 50 miles from Port Stanley. But the small SAS patrol on Mount Kent was just 10 miles from the capital. Such an advanced position, free of the enemy, focused the minds of the land commanders now ashore. 
Mount Kent is rather like the top of a stairway leading down to Stanley. It's the highest mountain in the area. Once you're up there, it's downhill all the way. So Mount Kent, to my mind, was the key to this whole thing. Julian Thompson and Michael Rose wanted to act fast and move troops up to secure the mountain. And we should have moved on the 25th of May, four days after the landing. From there, the British artillery could shell all their positions. But the advance to capture Mount Kent was about to stall due to the biggest logistical disaster of the war. I remember thinking and saying to all my fellow officers, the 25th of May is Argentina's national day. It is inconceivable that they won't conduct a big strike. And we were all thinking to ourselves, we've just got to get through till sunset and things will be fine. The biggest British supply ship, Atlantic Conveyor, moved in with a naval escort to unload its cargo. I have to say that I wasn't aware that Atlantic Conveyor was coming in in daylight. Unlike the Royal Naval vessels, the civilian container ship had no anti-missile protection. When the convoy was attacked by Exocet missiles, the warships fired aluminium strips, known as chaff, to attract the projectiles away from their targets. But behind the curtain of chaff lay the Atlantic conveyor. And then we heard that Atlantic Conveyor had been struck by one, maybe two Exocets. At the time, we, th we thought it was criminal that Atlantic Conveyor was brought in before sunset on that day. And uh, even today, I don't know who made that decision. The ship's supplies were essential to the land forces. Four Chinooks, a lot of Wessex helicopters, all our combat supplies, rations, tents, had all gone down in the Atlantic Conveyor. The whole game was changed hugely. I remember thinking, oi, oi, this is all getting a bit serious. After the loss of five ships and with five brigades still a thousand miles away, the politicians back home were becoming impatient. Their attention was drawn to the settlements of Darwin and Goose Green, the sites of an Argentine garrison and an airfield. Margaret Thatcher was increasingly saying, look, we have to give something to the people of this country to show what we're doing. War is politics by another means, isn't it? So I sent for H and I said, you're not going to have to capture it. H was Herbert Jones, the commander of Two Para. We all called him H. He was fiercely loyal. He was fun to be with, very proud of the battalion. He was an absolute military fanatic. And he was a very good soldier. The attack on Darwin Goose Green to the south of the beachhead meant delaying the move to Mount Kent, championed by Michael Rose. Good news for the two para commander. H. Jones came running back saying, ha ha, you've lost your move and I've got my battle back. Well, it was an absolute shock to me. We were suddenly held up on our main advance and ordered to go and attack Darwin Goose Green, which was in quite the wrong direction. To go and attack off the line of march, an unnecessary target, use up time, use up resources, was completely nonsensical. The plan was that they would have taken Goose Green by first light, but the light had started to come up, and I think things had ground to a halt, and this particular uh, trench was holding them up. And he was not somebody who would ask people to do something he wasn't prepared to do himself. He was leading a platoon attack, and as he approached a machine gun position, he was scythed down. That was taken where they landed initially. It was in his camera when it was returned. It's quite a precious photograph, really. Twenty paras were killed in that battle, including my good friend H. Jones. Lieutenant Colonel Jones. Captain Wood. Captain James. People say, retrospectively, that it was a great psychological blow to the Argentines, but the psychological blow was not nearly as great as it would have been had an artillery batteries from uh, Mount Kent been closing down every single Argentine defence position with observed artillery fire. With the advance on Port Stanley delayed by the assault on Goose Green 
and its five brigade prepared to disembark in San Carlos water. The small SAS force on Mount Kent was discovered by the Argentinians. Because we hadn't moved to Mount Kent when we should have done on the 25th of May, the Argentines had already flown in some special forces units to knock us off the top of Mount Kent. Julian Thompson ordered Marines from 4-2 Commando forward by helicopter to take Mount Kent. We were hugging the ground. The helicopter was getting thrown from side to side. Everything's in pitch black. We're going 60 kilometers into no man's land here. Are we going to be fighting for our lives as soon as we jump off? We pile out of the chopper and there's a firefight in progress and tracers streaking all over the place. I was absolutely terrified. I just huddled behind a rock, um, wondering at what moment I'd meet my maker. By the time we got there, the Argentine special force were almost up onto the ridge from which they could have brought direct fire down onto the landing helicopters. Then, as Julian Thompson said, it would have been game over. If the operation had been 10, 15 minutes antes, possibly we would have been in force superior in the place, and the British Britannica would have been arriving in the form of the most vulnerable within the helicopters, subject to the fire of Nuestra gente desde tierra. So it was down to 10 minutes that we might well have lost the war. After a fierce fight, the British drove off the Argentinians from the peak. We yonked right up to the absolute summit of the mountain. And through binoculars, we could see the Argentines moving around. For the first time, you thought, maybe we're going to win this thing. We were within reach of Port Stanley. We'd come all this way, and suddenly there was this little hamlet with red roof houses in the distance. It made you wonder, have we come all this way just for that? The capture of Mount Kent cleared the way for more Marines and Paras to move up for the final assault. But with a shortage of helicopters from the loss of the Atlantic conveyor, most of them had to walk. Nobody forgets how large the Falklands are. Taken together, the land mass is the size of Wales. The three power and four five commander were the only ones that walked across the island. It was about 90 k's. Uh, we all had about 150 pound on our back. The ground was terrible. And if you stand on the tuft of grass wrong, you slide off and you can snap your ankles. And that was a march from hell. It really was. It was so hard. With Marines and Paras now advancing across the north part of East Falkland, Julian Thompson and his team still favoured a swift strike on the capital. But the arrival of Jeremy Moore and Tony Wilson's five brigade at San Carlos put a stop to that. I was about to give orders for, for our attack when I was told about the move round to the south, and I stopped it. Moore proposed a new plan, moving five brigade along a separate southern route, a so-called great leap forward, allowing them to catch up with the Marines and Paras. Now scant resources would have to be shared between two brigades. I didn't for the life of me think that I would have to look after the logistics of five brigade as well. But I had to divide my very slim resources twice as much as before. And I did get over and see uh, the commander of five brigade to try and bend his ear a bit. And I came away empty handed. I think that's probably as far as I dare go. We'll tell you everything that we know at this time. I'll also tell you what I intend to find out as soon as I may find it out and how I intend to find it out. And at the end of the day, well, then you'll be right up to speed, totally in my mind, and you'll know exactly what's going on. Tony Wilson said the intelligence is going to be so good that you'll know the name of the man in the trench opposite. And we all thought, yeah, 
The only real intelligence we got was off the BBC World Service. And that bloody idiot Wilson took it upon himself to mobilise his brigade and start moving along the south. Crazy thing to do. And I've long had my eye on moving as far forward as I could get so that I could get myself poised for whatever comes in what you might call the final phase. And certainly, Fitzroy and Bluff Cove were two places that we particularly wanted. I perceived that Tony was engaged in some sort of race with three commander brigade to get his chaps there first. The thing about military setups is everyone thinks about their own side. You know, the, uh, even people on your own side who aren't part of you are the enemy. Brigadier Wilson wanted Fire Brigade to move quickly, but there was little transport available. His first proposal met resistance. Well, John Cross was one of my favourite officers. I love John Crossland dearly, because he's a sort of complete rebel. Tony Wilson wandered in and said, I want you to walk to Fitzroy. And John looked up and said, Brigadier, are you pissed? <laughs> well, one of the principles of, of war is concentrate your force and we were, we were spreading ours out. And it's like not having enough Marmite to put in your bread and butter in the morning. If you start spreading Marmite on the wrong things, you'll end up with nothing worth eating. The idea that we should attack from coast to coast with inadequate combat and logistic resources, and most of all, an inability to communicate from the headquarters round to the southern flank, I was shocked when I heard, uh, and I even tried to argue with um, General Jeremy Moore, who wasn't in a listening mode. And um, I, it was the first time I felt, uh, during the entire uh, war, that we might actually lose this war. It was a very silly thing to do, in my opinion, because to start with, the only way down there to take supplies and people was by sea. And it's a 17-hour trip round, so you can't do it in darkness. As 3 Commando Brigade consolidated its positions around Mount Kent, 5 Brigade began their great leap forward. Most of the troops would need to be moved by ship. But without the knowledge of other commanders in the field, Brigadier Wilson decided to fly to power to secure Fitzroy by commandeering the last remaining Chinook helicopter. We shoved as many soldiers as we could into that Chinook, and we kept cramming them in, and when they didn't fit any longer, we literally booted them into the, into the helicopter and got them in. My brigade recce troop are on some high ground overlooking Fitzroy, about 10 miles away. And they saw a Chinook landing at Fitzroy. We assumed, because the Argentines had Chinooks, that it must be some kind of raid. And so we started to call down a, an uh, artillery strike on the helicopter. And the guns were being heaved round from pointing that way to pointing that way. The senior uh, gunner realised that it actually might be uh, our own, so that at the last minute the strike was called off. So we nearly lured a fire mission regiment onto our own side because we weren't kept in the picture as to what the hell was going on. But five brigades' troubles were only just beginning. By the evening of the 7th of June, the final shipment of Welsh Guards was being moved to catch up with the rest of five brigade. The only way to ferry them round to the southern forward bases was by ship from San Carlos. This meant a 17-hour journey on the unprotected vessel, the Sir Galahad. We were given a clear set of plans. We would be taken around under cover of darkness and offloaded into Bluff Cove. Things slightly altered. The medical corps was put on board the Galahad to go around to come off at Fitzroy. This delayed our sailing, as a result of which there was not the possibility of offloading us in or around Bluff Cove under cover of darkness. By daybreak, Sir Galahad and another supply ship, Sir Tristram, were off Fitzroy, still short of Bluff Cove. 
250 Welsh guards on board the Galahad waited whilst ammunition, a medical team and an anti-aircraft unit were unloaded. I remember saying, well, I thought well, it was meant to be escorted with some frigate or some ship or something, which weren't there. That was a bit worrying. We were quite shocked that the ships were out there in the open, somewhere where none of us expected the campaign to have gone, to tell you the truth. In plain sight of an Argentinian observation position and also during daylight. My concern is, why was it taking so long unloading? I spoke to the commanding officer. I tried to urge him to get off. They were sitting ducks and totally open to Argentinian air attack. He advised us to get off as, as soon as we could, which uh, my immediate boss uh, understood, wanted to clarify orders, but at the end of the day, we wanted to get ashore as soon as we could. The Skyhawks came in to attack and were out again with our gunfire chasing them too late. There's a massive explosion. The, the whole ship rocked and everything went sort of instantly black. There were a load of lads burst through the door and they just shouted, the ship's been hit. We knew nothing until we saw the black smoke billowing out of the landing ship, Sir Galahad. I was physically lifted up and blown probably about eight feet backwards. You breathe in and you're breathing in this toxic mess. And you shout out to everybody else, get down, get down on the floor. In that moment, you were so vulnerable. You just felt like a child that's been completely immersed in some appalling experience. We were now on our hands and knees. We couldn't go back because we had guys coming in behind us. We couldn't go any further. It was just absolute pandemonium. I remember turning around and saying, we're done for, this, this is us. There was a couple of lads with their heads on fire. Anyone that was in there wasn't surviving. It was just rounds coming at us, bombs. Yeah. We'd like to see if there's any more casualties, but I think anyone in there was 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 gone. Just horrific, really. I've never seen anything like that before, and probably never seen anything like that afterwards. Sorry. Every boat and landing craft went out to help. The unanswered question was why hadn't they been used five hours earlier to get the men off as soon as they'd arrived? There have been some incredibly heroic acts carried out by a number of guardsmen in the way in which they went back into this blazing inferno to try and help pull people out. The way in which they came together to get themselves off that boat was outstanding. I think it needs to be recognized. I mean, what were we doing, tracking a thin red line coast to coast? I mean, how did it happen? Had we rolled the attack on the 30th of May, when Julian Thompson felt he was able to do it, then, of course, uh, we'd have probably won the war in the next two or three days, uh, and we would have never had to suffer the awful losses that we did uh, incur by aiming up a southern flank. This great leap forward was completely unnecessary and sadly cost uh, 200 casualties from the attack on the Sir Galahad. I was fortunate enough to be the captain of the Welsh Guards rugby team. 
Unfortunately, on the Galahad, we lost two really prominent members of that side, two outstanding members of that side, in Cliff Ellie and Andy Walker. There hasn't been a day since the 8th of June, 1982, that I have not remembered them in some way. Thirty-two Welsh Guardsmen lost their lives, along with 11 other servicemen and five crew members. 150 were wounded. Despite the setback of Fitzroy, the war still had to be won. The advance on Port Stanley was blocked by a ring of mountaintop defences, and time was running out. Admiral Woodward said that he was unable to sustain the carrier force at sea beyond mid-June. So in, in Wellington's words, it was really a very close-run thing. I've never been so cold in my life. It was the wind chill. But on top of that, every couple of hours, you got a torrential rainstorm. Some people went without resupply of food for three days. The logistic shortfall created by fire brigade was a very significant effect on, on us. I can remember being starving hungry. We were making 24-hour ration packs stretched to two or three days. We were using water out of muddy puddles. Very grim existence. The boots simply were hopeless and trench foot became an increasing issue. In the morning, when I looked at my feet, I couldn't believe it. They were like size 15, they were massive. The pain I was going through was like someone had grabbed your foot, got a needle, stuck it in and started scratching the bone. There was no danger of being defeated by the Argentines. There was a serious danger of being defeated by exposure. If we'd had to go on for another two weeks, probably things would have been different. The next day, British forces began the battle for Port Stanley, attacking the mountaintop defences around the capital. Royal Marines prepared to attack Mounts Harriet and Two Sisters in night assaults. Three Paras objective was Mount Longdon. The Sergeant Major, Johnny Weeks, what a man, amazing man. He gave his speech, you know, and he said, if you've got a god, perhaps you might want to pray to them and some of you might not come back. He gave us the truth, which is what we needed. We knew we were gonna go into Hell's Gate. We then set off and it was silent and I could see Mount Longdon, it was a silhouette and it reminded me of Scooby-Doo when you see the, the, the haunted castle in the silhouette. My skin was alive, it was prickly, it was really weird. As we got closer, I heard that noise, the explosion. <laughs> A friend of mine, Brian Milnes, stood on the mine and he was in agony. And then the whole, the whole world lit up. It was pitch black. The sky changed colour with the illuminating rounds. It was just hell. The guy who was just one foot away from me got shot in the eye and went down. The guy was dead before he hit the ground. Nosotros, eh, era, era, en ese momento era matar o morir, no nos importaba nada. O sea, fue muy duro. Nos tiraron con todo. O sea, y, y bueno, lamentablemente tuvimos que retroceder. Ya habíamos perdido mucha sangre, muchos heridos, muchos, muchos caídos. We were up fighting for a day and a half and then getting bombarded for a day and a half. We couldn't sleep. All of a sudden, this flash just went past my eyes and I dropped down 
And I looked up and I could see a sniper taking a headshot at me. A lot of the leaders have been taken out, and we just pick our own battles, basically. We do what we were trained to do. We actually defeated the enemy by using our initiatives and fighting together. I'll tell you who wins wars, the troops. Generals can make plans. The responsibility for making it work devolves very quickly down to the lowest level. In the battle for Longdon, more than 200 British and Argentine troops were wounded and 50 killed. After we defeat the enemy, we had to then look after our dead. Uh, it's only right and proper. To, to pick them up and move them was the worst thing I've ever done. It actually is one of the triggers for my PTSD today, because I keep seeing a certain incident where I had to remove one of our soldiers' helmets, and it wouldn't come off. So I got told to kick it off. And when I did, I wasn't expecting to see what I saw. But that haunts me to this day. After more desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the Scots guards took Mount Tumbledown and two para captured Wireless Ridge. The British Army had fought some of its hardest battles since World War II. But another struggle for Port Stanley loomed. Se pretendía que se moviera la gente de las posiciones, se saliera a combatir en forma ofensiva. To avoid a bloodbath and heavy civilian losses, the Argentine commander, General Menendez, had to be persuaded their situation was hopeless. Michael Rose opened negotiations and relayed them back to London using the portable satellite phone. Listening to them now after 40 years is really makes the hair go up on the back of your head, hearing a sort of a voice from 40 years ago who did not know what the outcome of the negotiations would be. No one's ever listened to them before. This is me talking now, sitting in the room, um, opposite Menendez, who had a sort of team of people. Whereas Menendez, having to leave the room and go and talk to, obviously, President Galtieri about what the next step should be, all I had to do, if I needed reassurance or clarification at some point, was to pick up the telephone and talk straight back to London. And so I had the moral and psychological advantage of joining the negotiations from the outset. End of the war. Tomé una pequeña bandera argentina que tenía dentro de mi campera durante toda la campaña. No quería que fuera un souvenir para ningún británico. La tiré al fuego de la estufa y lloré como un chico. Yo no, no creo en guerras justas e injustas. Yo no, 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 no creo. Una gota de sangre, tanto de un argentino o un inglés, tiene un sufrimiento detrás. Eh, y no es bueno para el mundo. No es bueno. I have just heard that the white flag is flying over Stanley. Ready? It has taken 40 years for some to reveal what they really think about key aspects of the war. I mean, the truth certainly needs to be told about some of the things that went wrong. The Board of Inquiry into the loss of the uh, Tristram and the Galahad turned out to have been a complete whitewash by saying it was necessary to open up a southern flank. Actually, the opposite is true by 180 degrees, but that remains in the public record today, that the southern flank was essential to the retaking of Port Stanley. Wrong. It was not, and it nearly cost us the war. Lieutenant Colonel Jones. The order to attack and capture Goose Green. Well, it 
it slowed the whole thing down. I mean, I thought it was a stupid thing to do, and we wouldn't have lost so many people. Maybe eight would be alive today. Corporal Hartman, Corporal Sullivan. These lessons do need to be learned so that it doesn't happen again. That's, it's not about catching people out and slagging people off or anything like that. It's about making a difference in the future, isn't it? The task force returned to a rapturous welcome. And there were all these boats and people and bands, and it was fantastic. There was one unexpected cost of the victory. It is estimated that up to 28% of those involved in close quarters action suffered some form of trauma. I was violent. I was having fights with people. I was getting into trouble. I was doing things that were just nonsensical, things that I'd never even dreamed of doing now or before. It totally changes your personality. 40 years on, it's a long time. But in many ways, it's no time. I've got those families with me now. I've got those guys with us I'm sitting here now talking to you. They've been with me every day of my life and will be so. And then wherever we go at the end of life, I'll go and join them. There we are. It's the end of the British stiff upper lip. It would have been unthinkable to a previous generation of veterans uh, to talk about their combat experiences. And in a way, it also indicates a breaking down of rigid class divisions. I think the Falklands War was an extraordinary military achievement. I don't think it's just sentimentality to say that we came back after that war to a different sort of Britain from the Britain that we left. And we discovered that even if we weren't very good at making motor cars, we could still win a jolly good little colonial war. It was crazy, but it was wonderful. So I went back to the Falklands in 2002, and we looked out, the water was still, and we just started crying. It was uncontrollable crying with our shoulders rocking up and down. I've never felt like that before in my life. The last day, I got up Mount Longdon, where the sniper took a headshot at me. I just felt sorrow. I'm so proud of what we did, but the price of having PTSD is quite a high price, but I wouldn't change it. It's, it's, it is what it is, you know? And the thing is, I'm alive. There's 23 of my colleagues who are not alive, so I have to live my life for them, and I do that every day. And support information can be found online at channel4.com slash support. So tomorrow night, veteran homicide detectives try to unravel the truth behind the disturbing case. All new Police Custody USA starts at 10. <laughs>